My name is Isil Khan and in this video we will learn the number of dumpers calculation for filling. And remember the filling may be just uh, the filling of trench and it may be the filling of concrete work, the filling of asphalt work, no problem. I am not discussing that. Here our approach is to calculate the number of dumpers per filling. It may be any type filling, no problem. Alright, so uh, let me just show you a few examples over here. If you see these examples, there uh, is just the need of filling over here uh, inside uh, these. Uh, these are actually the bathrooms maybe. If you see inside the inside area uh, of these uh, brickwork, right? And we need uh, to fill these guys with uh, the soil maybe or any other material. If you see this one, uh, which is at the right side of this picture, you can see the material clearly, of course, the filling material. So so how much or how many number of dumpers are required to fill these areas, right? These inside areas which are the bathrooms of course. Uh, uh, let me show you another example. If you see these trenches of course and you want to fill these guys with the soil. Uh, actually nobody fill these guys with the soil. Uh, these can be filled with the concrete work or you can say uh, the stone work if you see in the picture. So if we have to fill these trenches with the stone work then how much number of dumpers are required to fill these guys. So this is a good question and let's learn how do we answer this and let's suppose if we have a room right this is just the isometric view of the room let me write if I can write better let's say this one right this is just a simple room 30 times 30 times 3 this is just the size of the room suppose. Now if we are asked to determine the number of dumpers or the number of trucks you can say having size 14 times 8 times 2 feet. We are also informed to assume the filling material is ordinary soil. Also assume pebbly percent depth losses due to compaction. So this is actually uh, quite simple terms if you see in the examples. So I'll come directly into solution over here. And in the solution, if you see, we are asked to determine the number of dumpers. And the number may be the ratio of same quantities. So the number of dumper must be the pelling volume divided by the volume of dumper, right? Let's call this formula as equation 1. And for this equation, let me just calculate the pelling volume first. And you can see this is already known, which is the size of inside room, 30 times 30 times 3 feet. But this is not the full filling volume, right? This may be the compacted volume over here. And if you see in the example terms, we are informed to assume pebbly percent depth losses due to compaction. This means the depth should be increased half because we are losing the half depth due to compaction, right? So this must be the filling volume, which is 40 pept CFT. CFT means the cubic feet. And now we have to calculate the volume of dumper which must be at size 14 times 8 times 2 feet and there is no losses due to compaction because the dumper is a dumper we don't need to compact the material inside the dumper right so 14 times 8 times 2 feet this must be 224 CFT now we can calculate the number of dumpers using the same equation you can say equation 1 like the number of dumpers must be the pelling volume that's all Already known we have done this a few seconds ago or a few minutes ago which is 40 50 CFT divided by the volume of dumper it's already known if you see 22 4 CFT if you see so if you divide 40 50 by 224 we can get the number of dumpers equals 18.08 numbers or you can say just the number of dumpers equals 18 numbers so for the same room, you should order 18 number of dumpers, which size must be 14 times 8 times 2 feet. So this is how we can calculate the number of dumpers required per filling, you can say, and that's it, right? And at the end, make sure you thumbs up and hit the subscribe button. Also hit the notification button and never miss another update from an engineer boy. So can you determine an area of a property on site? Hello, my name is Isil Khan and you are watching an engineer boy. Actually, there are many things I want to cover in this short video. Like in this video, 
we will learn an area determination of simple geometric shapes and this will be little quick because everybody understand the basics so the main goal is to determine an area of irregular shapes like an irregular rectangle or in short way i can say an irregular polygons because everything is a polygon when it comes to an area determination except shapes having curves. And the next thing I want to explain is the misunderstanding of engineers in common patwaris. Because I have seen many people especially on YouTube teaching in average parmulas instead of correct parmulas. And the last thing which I want to discuss in this video is the manual calculation and then checking it with the help of software to make sure if the calculation is okay or not. So let's get started. And I will start with an area of simple geometric shapes and that's actually so simple. Like an area of a square is its side square, area of a rectangle is the product of its two sides like length breadth multiplication area of a right angle triangle is one half of area of a rectangle or one half base times its height. Area of a skeleton triangle can be calculated with the help of Hero formula which I am going to explain later later. Area of an equilateral triangle can be found by the same formula as one half times base times its height or 0.433 times its side square. Area of a circle can be found with the help of pi r square or pi d square divided by 4. Area of a regular polygon can be one half its perpendicular times its perimeter and so on. I don't wanna waste much time over here because our main goal is to cover irregular shapes. So let's go ahead to talk about an irregular shapes or properties. Remember, whenever you face an irregular property on site and want to work out its area, an easy way is to split the whole property into simple geometric shapes. And the best thing, according to me, is the triangulation. Yes, so you have to convert or split your property into triangles and then calculate an area of each triangle separately and add them together to get an area of the whole property. For example, let's say if we have to determine an area of the given property. So how can we do this? First of all, just visit or take a look to the boundary of the property and specify its corner with the help of ranging rods or in arrows. You can also use piece of wooden sticks if you work and do not have rods, pegs or in arrows. After specifying all corners, then measure all the edges of the property. Once you are done with the edges, then just take measurements of the diagonals to have triangles of course. And here I'm going to repeat that diagonal is must over here. In the same situation, if you do not take diagonal, you cannot calculate the correct area of the property. You can only calculate an average value which is not actually the solution of the problem. Once you take all measurements, then label each triangle with numbers. Like in my situation, let's say triangle 1 and triangle 2 and then do your manual calculation and let's do just a manual calculation over here. Remember in this calculation, I'm going to calculate an area of the property with the help of two formulas and we will compare the answer of each formula with the answer of software to check and satisfy which formula is okay and which one formula does not give the correct answer. So let me call one solution with the wrong solution and one with the correct solution. And I will start from the wrong solution which is followed by most people and students. For example, this one method in formula. Let's talk about this one. According to this formula, take an average of the opposite sides and multiply it with an average of the other two sides to get the whole area of the given shape. Like in this case, the total area of the property must be 63.25 plus 58 divided by 2, which is the average of two opposite sides, times 77 plus 55 divided by 2, which is the average of the other remaining sides. 
and that's actually not the correct answer right but however we are doing our hair just to satisfy the solution a uh, little late right and if you do little uh, math with the given formula of course we can get the total area equals 4001.25 square feet and now let's come into the correct calculation which i want you to do always on site and i'm sure this will take enough time but i'm also sure this calculation is the correct calculation the best way over here is to use the hero formula for each triangle and let me determine an area of the triangle one in triangle first all sides are known so i can calculate the semi parameter of the triangle like s equal summation of all sides divided by 2 or you can say s equals 55 plus 63.25 plus 75 and divided by 2 do little math with this of course we can get the semi parameter of the triangle equals 96.625 feet and now let's put all the values in the hero formula so area equals square root s which is 96.625 times again s minus one side which is 55 into s again minus other side which is of course 63.25 times s and minus the last side which is 75 feet if you use your mind or your calculator of course you can end up or you should end up with an area equals 1703.768 square feet as the area of triangle first now let's calculate an area of the second triangle and of course we'll do the same thing as we did for the area of the first triangle so when you do calculation for an area of the second triangle you should end up with an area equals 2000 and 36.026 square feet and finally let's add an area of the ball triangle to have the total area of the property so the total area must be an area of the triangle first plus an area of the second triangle our total area equals 1703.768 plus 2036.026 which is of course the total area equals 3739.794 square feet now let's draw the same property in AutoCAD to check which one formula is okay and I will draw this little quickly because I don't want to waste uh, much time and I don't want the video to be longer so let's draw it little quickly so as you can see I have drawn the same property which area was determined by me a few seconds ago now let me apply a nice function up in AutoCAD to determine its area for which we will type and enter double A in command bar after which we'll type and enter O for an object and then we'll simply click in object or the boundary of our property AutoCAD will show the total area of the property in the command bar. You can of course copy and paste it where you want. So according to the software, that's the AutoCAD, the total area of the plot or property is 3739.794 square feet. And now let's decide which one formula or which one method is okay. Of course the last method, I mean an area by hero formula is okay. So next time, please do not use these sort of formulas because the difference is very huge. So whenever you want to calculate area of an irregular shape, the best thing is to split the whole property into triangles and then calculate area of each triangle. After that, you can add them together, of course, to get the whole property area. And that's it. And the last thing I want to do is asking a question from you. I want you to calculate an area of a triangle which does have all sides as shown and I'm sure also of course that you cannot solve it so I want to solve it as well remember this geometry does not have any area because this is not a triangle you can ask me how because some of two sides of the triangle must be greater than the third one and the shown triangle does not satisfy the rule so this is not a triangle 
which means the shown thing does not have any area and air set. And now come on, I want a like, share and subscribe. Come on, do it. Nothing is impossible. You can do it. Just hit that subscribe button. Do it. Assalamu alaikum dears, myself Silke. This section will provide detailed solution to a rise in poll table. Remember the rise poll table can be used to determine the reduced level of points which are taken at stop rod using leveling machine. Before starting the solution, I'll start by drawing the rise in poll table. This table contains the column of number, backside, interside, pore side, rise in poll, that's why this table is known by rise poll table, and then the RL and of course remarks. Let me draw some rods like in this palm 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and of course 9. Let's we have taken some readings on leveling stuff like in this palm. The main purpose of solving this table is to calculate the RL of each point. Remember the peg side is always taken at benchmark, so the first RL must be known. As the RL of first point is known, so we need the RL of all these remaining points from 2 to 9. To calculate the RL of all these points, we need of course the rise and fall of each point. To calculate the rise and fall of each point, we start by subtracting the intersides from big sides. Like BS minus IS. This will give us the rise and fall. When the subtraction value is positive, it means its rise. When the subtraction value is negative, it means its fall. Like 1.123 minus 1.321, this is of course just the PAL. I'm not putting the minus video over here because the column of PAL contains all the videos having minus. And then we subtract the interside from interside. So 1.321 minus 2.311, this is of course also just a PAL. And then interside minus interside, like 2.311 minus 2.001, this is of course just the rise, because the value is just positive, 0 0.110. And lastly, the interside minus pore side, like 2.001 minus 1.355, this is of course also just a rise. Here again, we are passing with back side, so back side minus interside will be rise or fall, like 1.522 minus 2.311. This is of course just the PAL. Here again I'm not putting the sign of minus because the PAL column just contain all the videos having minus. And again interside minus interside will be rise or PAL. Like 2.311 minus 2.242. This is of course just the PAL. 0.131. And again, interside minus interside, like 2.442 minus 1.881 will be just of course the rise, because the VDV is just positive, 0.561. And lastly, the interside minus pore side will be rise or fall, like 1.881 minus 1.911. This is of course just the PAL, 0.110. Here when we have the rise and fall of each point, then the calculation of reduced level for all these remaining points is quite simple and straightforward. Let's say I need just the RL of point 2. Remember the new RL must be the old RL minus the PAL, or it must be the old RL plus the rise. Like the RL minus the PAL will be just of course the new RL like 100 minus 0.198 will be of course 99.802. So 99.802 is just the RL of 0.2. Here again the next point is just the PAL. Like 99.802 minus 0.790 will be just of course 99.012. So this is just the RL of 0.3. And again, if you see the next point is just the rise. So the new RL must be the old RL plus the rise. Like 99.012 plus 
0.110, this is of course 99.122 and so on. Do the same for all these remaining points like 99.122 plus 0.446 is of course 99.568 and 99.568 minus 0 0.789 is just of course 98.779 also this RL minus 0.131 is of course 98.648 here again we have the rise so the old RL plus the rise will be of course 99.2 209 and again we have the fall so 99.209 minus 0 0.110 is of course 99.099 hey I just forgot in the remarks the CP are the chain point and this is just the last reading and this topic is about the horizontal distance determination using leveling machine Actually, the method I'm going to explain is not only special for leveling machine. Of course, this method can be used using tachometer or any other instrument like telluride, etc. If there are two points on Earth's surface like point A and point B, and we need the distance between these two points. Here the distance means the horizontal distance between these two points. To find the distance, we just set the instrument at one of these points and the graduated stop at another point. Also, we need the upper ear and lower ear readings. Let's the upper ear reading is 1.112 and the lower ear reading is just 0.654 meter. Now we can use a nice plug and chug in formula like the top reading minus the bottom reading times the constant will be the horizontal distance between point A and point B. Let's do some plug and chug in like the distance, the top reading is 1.112 minus the bottom reading is 0.654 meter times the constant. The constant may be different for every type instrument, but mostly we use 100. But how can we get this constant? Or where these constants come from? Remember when you buy a new thing, there is always a nice manual with that. Similarly, when you buy a new leveling machine, there is always a manual with that. So the constant can be found in that manual. Do some maths, you will get of course the distance equals 45.8 meters. And this is it. So, how do you differentiate a one-way and two-way slab? Hey, my name is Isil Khan and you are watching an engineer boy. Slabs are basically two-dimensional construction members which can be provided to cover floors and transfer the loads further to beams or directly to columns. Slabs can be constructed directly on columns or on beams, which can divide the slab into two types or classes. That's why we can see these two terms about slabs, like the one-way slab and two-way slab. So how do we differentiate one-way and two-way slab? Well, that's simple. You have to just keep in mind a few things. Like you can say a slab is one way when a slab is supported on two edges and bends only in one direction. If the slab is supported on four edges and bends in two directions, then that's known by two-way slab. However, Sometimes it's hard to decide whether the slab is one way or two way by looking into the supports. That's why we also have to consider the length breadth ratio into account. Like if the length to breadth ratio of the slab is equal to or greater than two, then the slab may be considered as a one way slab. And if the length to breadth ratio of the slab is less than 2, then the slab may be called as a two-way slab. And one another thing, a one-way slab is designed for the spanning direction alone. The main tension bars of such a slab runs parallel to the span. And for the transfer direction, a minimum amount of shrinkage reinforcement is provided. And in case of two-way slab, the main reinforcement is designed for both directions. 
So these are a few things which of course differentiate the one-way and two-way slab. So again, a slab is one way when a slab is supported on two edges and bends only in one direction. Such a slab does have length to breadth ratio equal or greater than two. These slabs are designed for the spanning direction alone. And of course, if the slab is supported on four edges and bends in two directions, then that's known by a two-way slab. These slabs are of course designed for the both directions. And such a slab does have the length breadth ratio less than two, of course, and that's it. So this is how we differentiate the one-way and two-way slab. And if you have any question, let me know in the comment section. So what type of load acts on a structure? Hello, my name is Isil Khan and you are watching an engineer boy. Loads are forces that act on structures can be divided into three main classes like the dead load, live load and environmental loads. Let's talk about the first one, just the dead load. So what is the dead load? Remember dead loads are those which are constant in magnitude and fixed in location throughout the lifetime of the structure. Normally, the major part of the dead load is the self-weight of the structure, which can be determined with enough accuracy from the design configuration, structure dimensions, and density of materials. For example, in case if you need to calculate the weight of slab, you have to only calculate the volume of slab and then multiply the volume of slab with the material density. The material I mean just the slab is made up or built up, right? So this is how we determine the dead load of members of structures. And what are included in dead load? In case of buildings, the weight of floor pills, finished floor, and plaster ceilings are usually taken as dead loads. And an allowance is made for suspended loads such as piping and lighting fixtures. For bridges, dead loads may include wearing surfaces, sidewalks, and curves. And allowance is made for piping and other suspended loads. Now let's go ahead to talk about live loads. Remember live loads are usually unstable or just moving loads you can say. Or you can say live loads are those which consist cheaply of occupancy loads in buildings and traffic loads on bridges. They may be either fully or partially in place or not present at all and may also change in location their magnitude and distribution at any given time are uncertain and even their maximum intensities throughout the lifetime of the structure are not known with precision. The minimum life load per which the floors and roof of the building should be designed are specified in the building code that governs at the site of construction. Representative videos of minimum life loads to be used in a wide variety of buildings are found in minimum design loads per buildings and other structures, a little portion of which is shown in the following table. I have taken this table from a book designed of concrete structures, which is of course written by Nelson. This table gives uniformly distributed loads for different types of occupancies. Remember the videos shown in the table cannot be always used. The type of occupancy should be considered and the probable loads computed as accurately as possible. Live loads for highway bridges are specified by the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials in its LRFD bridge design specifications. And for railway bridges, the American Railway Engineering and Maintenance of Way Association has published the Manual of Railway Engineering which specifies traffic loads. And finally, let's talk about environmental loads. Remember, environmental loads are loads caused by natural forces such as wind pressure, rain load, snow load, earthquake loads, soil pressures on subsurface structures, and forces caused by temperature variation. Environmental loads at any given time are uncertain in both distribution and magnitude. So these are the main classes of loads acting on structure, the dead load, the live load, and environmental load. And if you want to study more on these structure loads, of course, you can check more on the following references. 
and hey if you like the video make sure you hit that subscribe button press the bell icon and never miss another update from an engineer boy As the leaves start falling down And the shadows above the town I can finally see you now I see the fear inside your eyes I see the pain in your smile I can finally see you now 